It's the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> That's right. Very soon, we will send your giving statements via first class mail to the mailing address we have for you in Realm. Remember, if you have access to your Realm account, you also have access to your giving statement. So, you don't have to wait. Just log in and download your statement. If you have any questions or need access to your Realm account profile, please contact our Realm Administrator at realm at metropolitanbaptist.org. Do you know persons in need of prayer while they are healing and recovering? Please submit their names to prayer at metropolitanbaptist.org and we will add them to our list. It's called The Light We Carry. And I think of it as a kind of a toolbox, a collection of some of the perspectives and practices I've gathered over the years to help keep me centered, even during times of high anxiety and stress. And my hope is that we can equip ourselves with new tools and attitudes so that together, maybe we'll be a little steadier with the understanding that none of us has to go through any of this alone. And I really can't wait to share even more with you. We want you to reflect and renew yourselves too. Join Reverend Adrian Blair Wise for The Light We Carry, a multi-generational virtual hybrid educational experience celebrating the light within you. This three-part class offering, beginning January 19 at 7 p.m., is based on The Light We Carry by Michelle Obama. Drawing from her life experiences, Michelle Obama shares the habits and principles she developed to successfully adapt to change and overcome various obstacles, the earned wisdom that helps her continue to become. Register on Realm today and purchase The Light We Carry, our guide by Michelle Obama through your favorite book retailer. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Join the PUSH ministry on Saturday, January 28, 2023, from 9 to 11.30 a.m. for their 12th annual church-wide prayer summit, Praying for Our Next. Rev. Dr. Portia Wills Lee from Atlanta, Georgia, will be our guest speaker. Register today on Realm for this event being held via Zoom. Sunday School has a new time. Join us every Sunday at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard via Zoom. Register on Realm to make sure you have access. For questions or additional information, please contact Servant Don Williams at School at metropolitanbaptist.org. The Metro Cares Fellowship Fund was established to provide financial assistance to members of our church family and community who have been impacted by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Please continue to support the fund with your gifts and don't hesitate to let us know if we can serve you. You can contact us at Matthew25 at MetropolitanBaptist.org. Metropolitan Family, please support the Christian Discipleship Council and the Matthew 25 Ministries as they kick off their annual Supper Bowl Sunday Food Drive. All donations will benefit our We Are One Body Food Pantry. Your donations can be dropped on Sundays, January 22nd, 29th, and February 5th in the chapel. The following items are needed. Oatmeal, cereal, peanut butter, jelly, syrup, canned meats, chicken, tuna, salmon, sardines, soups, Amy's lentil soup, chicken noodle, and tomato soup. You may also donate to the pantry via our five giving options. Just be sure to select or note food pantry. Your contribution will help us continue to be a blessing by extending our care to underserved communities in the DMV. Metropolitan Youth, Children and Youth Church is a fun place for kids pre-K 3 through 12th grade to learn lessons about God's love. Meet us on first, second, and fourth Sundays in the administrative wing of the church while parents and guardians are in 10 a.m. worship. 
We want each of you to attend the spiritually engaging and fun experience we call Children and Youth Church. So make sure your parents get you vaccinated and be sure to wear a mask. Parents, please register your child for these faith-based, fun Sunday mornings through Realm today. Metropolitan's Transportation Ministry is available to transport seniors and members to and from church and ministry events. Whether a loved one needs a ride or you need a pickup from the Largo Metro Station, we are here to serve. Please email the Transportation Ministry at transportation at metropolitanbaptist.org or call 202-770-8357 to let them know you need transportation. And on January 29, Reverend Michael Thomas will be preaching and we will share in Holy Communion together. Welcome to Metropolitan Baptist Church, where we stand firmly on the Word of God. Our inclusive hybrid worship experience seeks to reach all desiring to worship God. Our ministerial staff and our leadership continue to care about your well-being as we continue to practice COVID-19 safety protocols. We pray that your life is changed by today's offering of engaging praise, prayer, teaching, and preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for tuning in to worship with the historic Metropolitan Baptist Church, where we are a caring congregation, still standing on the word and under the cross. Our virtual worship experience will begin momentarily. Worship the Lord in all of your ways. Give him the glory all for your praise. Don't stop the worship, their answers for you. Yeah. Worship him in spirit and in truth. Worship the Lord in all of your for you. 
10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning, Metropolitan. Good morning, my Metropolitan family. Isn't it good to be in the house one more time? Isn't it good? I welcome those that are worshiping with us online. We just stand to give God praise today, to thank him for all that he has and continues to do in our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. The word of God says, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is great, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he is made, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down to worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture. The flock under his care, and another translation says, another um, says, we are the sheep of his hand. Isn't that good news today? Isn't that good news today? You know, there's been a song, there's been a song that's been resonating in my spirit all week long, and the song says, he's a way maker, he's a miracle worker, he's a promise keeper, he's light and darkness, let me say that again. He is a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper, and light in darkness. That's good news, saints. That is great news, saints. We can count on our God. Amen? Let us, let us worship him in spirit and truth this morning. Amen.
we're going to now have our centering prayer by servant Hans. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Metropolitan, it's time to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. As we enter into worship this communion Sunday, we stand in need of you. We need your presence, Lord. We need the power of of the Holy Spirit to rain down and fill the sanctuaries of our hearts. As we gather today to give you honor, to give you praises, to give you glory, thanksgiving, and the hallelujahs of our hearts. Lord, we give you all our hallelujahs. They belong to you. Lord, we ask that you bless the preacher of the hour, that you stand in him, that he might deliver a word from you that touches the people, your people. Father God, we lift up this prayer in the name of Jesus. We ask that you touch our worship services and that they may be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
We are now ready for our responsive church covenant. Amen. By what common and gracious experiences do we enter into spiritual fellowship and covenant relations with God and with one another? What is the great bond of our union with God and with each other? We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love. What are our great privileges and duties in this, our own church? To try for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, and discipline, and our what vows do we gladly make as stewards of that which God has entrusted to us? For the sake of our homes and our loved ones, what gracious tasks do we humbly assume? For the sake of the unsaved for whom our Savior died, to what manner of life and converse, uh, com conversation are we solemnly and sincerely pledged? To all circumstances in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our occasions, and exemplary in our deportment, to avoid all traveling, backbiting, and excessive anger, and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. Since one is our master, even Christ, and we all are the children of God, by what cooperative ministries are we to strengthen each and adorn the teachings of our Lord and Savior? We are to engage to watch over one another in family love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy and healing and courtesy. Together, humbly confessing our past sins, we pray for grace to keep these our holy vows. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen, church. You may be seated. We thank you all so much for joining us here. Can you give this wonderful senior choir a round of applause? Come on, that's good enough for me, but not for them. Come on, put your hands on it. Amen. We want to continue to encourage them. Um, as you all know, this is our second time singing. We sang back during the month of December, so we're so glad to see all these beautiful people uh, adorned in purple. Amen. And to see all your beautiful faces here. Uh, I love hymns, and so we've been singing them this morning. And so even though this is our sermonic selection, it is a hymn, and God is still worthy of honor and glory. So if at any given moment you feel led to come and join and sing with us, we ask that you please do so. To God be the glory.
Let's lift the church. Let the earth hear his voice. Let the people. Let the people. One more time, and, and give him the glory. One more time, church, all over the building. Let's praise the Lord. One more time, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Let the people rejoice. Praise the Lord. Great things he has done. Praise the Lord. Great things he has done and will continue to do. Amen? Amen. I want to start off this morning by first thanking my pastor Emeritus. Pastor Hicks and First Lady Hicks, for the ministry example that you have set for my wife and I. I want to thank Executive Pastor Wood, Diaconate Leader BJ, and the Diaconate, my fellow ministers at Metropolitan and my entire Metropolitan family, for the opportunity to, to come and stand behind this sacred desk. To stand on the word and under the cross behind this sacred desk. Amen. Amen. I want to thank my mom and my dad, and my mom-in-law, and my, my sisters that are out there watching and my brother that's out there watching. And lastly, I want to thank Reverend Dr. Demetra Hutchinson. <laughs> And my children, Naya and Lewis, for their support. Amen? Amen. We call ourselves the Fantastic Four. <laughs> I do have a rule when I, when I have you, got, you guys know the rule when I preach, amen? So if the person to your left or your right seems as though they're or faking like they're praying, <laughs> but, but they're really falling asleep, you can poke them. But when you poke them, you both have to jump up and say, hallelujah, amen. That's my rule, amen. Let us pray. Most gracious, wise, and holy God, Father, before there was anything, you were and you continue to be everything. You are the God that simply stands on the platform of nothing, and time after time after time, you create something. Decrease me so that you might increase in this place. That the words that are coming out of my mouth, Father, be the essence of that which you created from the beginning of time. Saturate this place with your very presence that the Holy Spirit, Father, the anointing, would be in every crack, every nook and cranny of this place. And Father, touch these thy people. Give them ears to hear and eyes to see. Spiritual senses awakened that they would not leave the same as they came into this place today. In the name of the one that was and is and is to come. In the name of Jesus, let the redeemed of the Lord say, Amen. Amen. I ask that you stand for the reading of this holy word. Amen. Amen. We won't stand long this morning. The scripture that has been given to us this morning is Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. That's Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. If 
people out there in the virtual world, hopefully you're, either you're in the bed or whatever you're in, you're opening up to that scripture. Amen? When you have the text, please say amen. Amen. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The title that has been given to us this morning is the journey to a way out of no way. The journey to a way out of no way. I wanted to start off by by sharing something with the church this morning. The Holy Spirit let me to do this. When I was eight years old, my family lived in Queens, New York, in, in Regal Park, in an apartment. And I had, a, I had a praying maternal grandmother that would sneak when my, when my dad could not hear. And she would tell me, she would tell me about God. She would, she would tell me about Jesus. You see, my, my father at that time, he, he didn't believe in God. You know, he had gotten one question wrong on his his SAT in the ninth grade. He was well educated. He he, he provided for his family. But he didn't believe in God. My grandmother was from Barbados and she was she was she was a wonderful spirit. She would make make breakfast with home baked bread every morning singing amazing grace. How sweet the sound, filling filling what was a violent and abusive household privately and an upstanding home publicly with the Holy Spirit. Some of y'all, some of y'all here know what I'm talking about, but it's hard to say amen, amen. And I remember one afternoon my, my mother was still at work. My dad was home from work early. I had gotten home from school, and, and my grandmother was making, making me a snack. She would make snacks from all types of stuff, amen? And she said in a Bayesian accent, Louis, don't you ever get all high sedity and whatnot. <laughs> Always bow down to Jesus. And my dad heard her, and he, and he rushed to confront my grandmother. And I got in between them. And he grabbed me by the throat, screaming, God does not exist. I was eight years old. And I pulled back and I said, I believe in God. And he hit me. And I said, I believe in God. And he hit me again. And I said, I believe in God. And he grabbed me and he threw me in a dark closet in the middle of the apartment. There was no light in the closet. It was pitch black dark and it was filled with jagged storage and every direction I moved I would be poked or scraped or rubbed. For 30 minutes he stood holding the door so that it it would not open while I remained in the dark. He screamed, if your God exists, have him get you out of this closet. Each time I screamed back, I believe in God. He asked me questions to dispel God's existence. Each time I yelled back, I believe in God. 
And finally, after 30 minutes, he let me out. And he got in my face, explaining scientifically and philosophically why God didn't exist. And as an eight-year-old, I stood firm and I said, I believe in God. And then he sent me to my room. Very early in my life, I was blessed. I was chosen. In total darkness in the closet, with no answers, with the only answer being a way out of no way, I came to know God. How do we navigate through unpredictable, uncertain, unimaginable, and uncomfortable, physical, spiritual, financial, and psychological extremism, oppression, manipulation, and suppression? How do we sustain hope when facing negative forces that reactively change the rules of engagement? Well after we have already sacrificed and struggled for righteous achievement, how do we achieve a way out of no way in those situations that align with God? I'm not talking about a small misfortune or discomfort. I'm not talking about an, an aspiration or acquiring a thing. I'm talking about one or even multiple doors being shut. I'm talking about godly perseverance this morning, amen? I'm talking about after we publicly and privately cried and, and sacrificed and prayed and, and struggled and, and as I often hear Reverend Wood say, reached up to touch bottom. And we found a way to, to climb out of a hole, only to face a mountain, and then a valley, and then a jungle with, with vicious predators, and then a wilderness to an unending, ever-changing, systematic ocean of calculated circumstance that stifles our God-given purpose. I am simply asking God this morning, what must we do? What must we do to consistently assert and achieve spiritual dominance? I'm simply asking God for the person in the congregation that is unemployed, underemployed, or in transition that, that had to reach in their couch cushions this morning to get enough gas money in order to get here. I'm asking for the person on the verge of eviction, homelessness, or foreclosure. I'm asking for the person contemplating taking their life I'm asking for that couple that is, that is about to give up. I'm asking for the church, the business, or the person on the verge of insolvency or bankruptcy. I'm asking for the person struggling with drugs or sexual or porno pornographic addiction. The person facing debilitating, painful, or terminal illness. The person facing anxiety, depression overwhelming stress or mental illness. What must we do to consistently assert and achieve spiritual dominance when facing that level of adversity? When we are required to, to walk on treacherous waters in order to overcome carefully and thoroughly built obstacles, obstacles designed to mentally and spiritually break us, to kill our God-given purpose, what then? What must we do to make a way out of no way? What then? In our scripture today in, in Matthew chapter 16, the disciples had a predisposition based solely on need for deliverance, self-preservation and for self-desire. They thought they, that Jesus had come to, to destroy, to overtake their, their governmental oppression. Unto us a child was born, and unto us a son was given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. 
and of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. That meant something different to them. After walking and sleeping and learning from Jesus for almost three years, they did not understand who he was. In this text in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, the disciples were distraught. For the first time, Jesus tells them he, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. For the first time, Jesus tells us that he is going to die. In their minds, the story was not supposed to go this way. In their minds, Jesus was their answer to ending the trauma. He was the answer for their perceived way out of no way. In the midst of their sanctification, they had followed without wavering. But they had not yet transformed. They had not yet reconciled their minds to the selfless truth. They were mindless to the selfless truth that was right in front of them. With all they had learned, they were, they were paralyzed in the dark closet of self-preservation and self-focused murmuring. And Jesus knew it. Jesus could see their intentions their distraction, and their fear. After almost three years, this is a critical point. This scripture is a critical point in their journey and preparation. This is a critical point in their awakening and final deliverance. They thought the answer to their problem was about to evaporate. That after all of their struggles and sacrifices, there soon would be no answer. And I hate to admit it, but they sound like us. When we knock and, and, and no door opens. When we seek and we do not find. These pre-ascension disciples fit into, the, into three self-preservation categories. Amen? The first category was the disciples that followed him, that loved him, truly loved him. The most. And this included Simon Peter, who was called Peter, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee. The second category was the disciples that followed him, that loved him, which included Peter, uh, uh, Peter's brother Andrew, and Philip and Bartholomew, or Nathaniel, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, or James the Less, and Thaddeus, or Judas, son of James and Simon the Zealot. The third category was a disciple that followed him solely for self-benefit. Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. Our text today is Jesus' response to their concern of his announcement that he was going to die. You see, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 and 25, Jesus said, if anyone desires this is his response to their concern about his death. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Are we willing to embrace this ahead of our dire situation? Are we willing to be conduits or vessels for a way out of no way by first doing this? Are we willing to take the time to, to contemplate, to deny ourselves, to, to sacrifice, to align every aspect and consideration of our entire life with Jesus? I'm talking about jobs, children, family, aspirations, goals, dreams, those we love, submitting everything. Are we willing? In verse 25, Jesus is asking the question, is there so much love inside of us that we are willing to forego our own self-preservation in order to prioritize eternal salvation for a stranger? 
or even an enemy. At this point in the scripture, the disciples were not there yet. But Jesus still made meticulous provision during their preparation and throughout their journey. He begins in the, in the very next chapter, in Matthew chapter 17, he reveals his deity, his true self to, to, to his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, the three that, that he was the closest to. Through his transfiguration on the mountain where these disciples could see the translucent Jesus and Moses and John the Baptist, he needed to comfort them. For them to understand who he really was, but not to tell everybody else. And after his transfiguration on the mountain in Matthew chapter 17, in verses 15 and 16, a noble man approaches Jesus saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he is an epileptic and suffers severely, and for he often falls into the fire and into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. After Jesus cures his son, the disciples, they, they were embarrassed and frustrated and, and perplexed. And they asked Jesus, why could we not make a way out of no way? Why could we not cast it out? And in Matthew chapter 17, verses 20 through 21, Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be, nothing, nothing, nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind comes out through prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. If my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. To humble is to fast. Going back to our text, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. To deny is to replace your flesh, your fear, your anxiety, your concern, not with great faith, but with mustard seed faith. To deny is, is, is to pray. It is total humility. It, it is to humble oneself through authentic fasting and sacrifice. To deny is to pick up your cross. And to pick up your cross is to take the time publicly and privately to do everything. To align your life with Jesus. You see, at this point in the scripture, the disciples were not there yet. But Jesus was still right there with them. Amen? As he is here with us this morning. He still made provision during their preparation and throughout their journey. A few weeks later. In John chapter 11, after the disciples and Jesus were in Bethany, they received word that Lazarus, one of Jesus' best friends, was gravely ill in Judea. And Lazarus needed Jesus. Now, Judea is, was two and a half miles away from Bethany. Jesus could have slapped on some Air Jordan sandals and jogged there in about 12 and a half minutes. But he waited. The disciples were like us. They're like, what, what is he doing? We need a way out of no way right now. His best friend is gravely ill. He needs to fix this immediately. But Jesus waited. He waited until Lazarus was dead for four days. And then he traveled to Judea. Now in Jewish faith, it is believed that the spirit can no longer re-enter the body after three days. 
And when he was almost there, he was met by Lazarus' sister Martha who said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Martha, nor the disciples, nor anyone else present understood the deity of Jesus. Jesus did not claim to have resurrection and life or understand secrets about resurrection and life. Jesus said that he is the resurrection and the life. To know Jesus is to know the resurrection and life. To have Jesus is to have the resurrection and the life. In this text, when he said, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live, he boldly challenged Martha to trust that he was a source of eternal life. Jesus openly presented himself at that point as a champion over death. And so after Jesus mourned with Mary, Lazarus' other sister, he raised Lazarus from the dead. In this text, Jesus is saying to the disciples and to us, deny your flesh. Be patient. The time frame is not relevant. Mm. What is relevant is the end result. In the appointed hour, he will show up in your situation and he will show out. Amen. Jesus is saying, you are asking for a Ferrari and I'm trying to give you a spaceship. <laughs> You're trying to be healed and I'm trying to heal your entire family and community. You're trying to be a traditional church and I'm trying to give you the resources to be a church that will change the world. In this text, Jesus is saying, you cannot achieve our text today by yourself. If anyone desires to come after, y'all remember, remember this before we go. If you, anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus is saying, in order to achieve our text today, you must believe that he is the resurrection and the life in the core of your soul. At this point in the scripture, the disciples had learned the power and, and the trust and, and to be patient. That victory would always come at the appointed time. But they are still not there yet. They still could not make a way out of no way. They still could not cast it out. But Jesus was still right there with them. He still made provision during their preparation and throughout their journey. Every step of the way, he told them it would not be easy. For after turning water into wine as a symbolic representation of his power, to make real in the world his ability to convert one thing to another thing, one circumstance to another circumstance in the blink of an eye, after witnessing to the woman at the well, after showing equality by witnessing to the Samaritans for which Jews had no dealing, after healing the noble man's son, after saving the soul of a paralytic and then healing his body, not because of the faith of the paralytic, but because of the faith of the four men willing to humble themselves in order to carry their friend up and through the roof. After manifesting the Holy Spirit that indwelled within him, to feed 5,000 souls with only five loaves of bread and a few fish. After teaching the disciples by, walk to, uh, by walking on water so that they too could walk on water if that was what they were eventually required to do. After yearning through the, the abrasive of rejection by getting beat by so many potential followers whose sins he could have washed away. After advocating and, and saving a woman who was caught in adultery by making a simple statement, let who, him who is without sin cast the first stone. 
after giving a blind man sight, raising Lazarus from the dead, being pierced in his side, and saying, I thirst, and then being given sour wine, finally proclaiming it, that it is finished. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And for a short period of time, the disciples thought the answer to their problem had evaporated. That after all their struggles and disappointments and prayers and sacrifices, there would be no answer. But Jesus kept his promise. As he told them in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, that he would be raised on the third day. After the disciples denied Jesus on the cross, in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he was still right there with them. The resurrected Jesus was still making provision, amen? In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, after the resurrection and just prior to the ascension, Jesus says to the disciples, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the end of the earth. What they were trying to do on their own prior to this point was impossible. Without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When we openly acknowledge our belief in Christ... He, he, he stays right there with us. Especially even in our reactive moments, he makes provision. We receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit by accepting Christ. But we cannot stay Christians without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? But when on top of that, when we deny ourselves and we pick up our cross and we follow him selflessly, we awaken the power of the Holy Spirit that indwells within us as Christians, as children of the almighty God. And so in Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4, Jesus' promise is fulfilled. For it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came the sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat up upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were no longer in darkness in the closet. They were awakened by the power of the Holy Spirit to see God's eternal love and God's eternal truth. They were free in their power to make a way out of no way to build God's kingdom, to build God's church. Their prayers changed. Their prayers changed from, Lord, give me that call. To, to Lord, give me that car so that I can build your kingdom. They made sure everything they did had some connection to God. They were no longer focused on that which was being denied. They, they were focused on receiving guidance and then taking action from the Holy Spirit. Through these disciples, a way out of no way and God's love was perpetually achieved. Within weeks of this day, the church expanded from followers to thousands of Matthew 16 believers and committed souls. Powerful. And then in Acts chapter 5, verse 14, it says, And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, 
multitudes of both men and women so that they brought the sick out of the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits and they were all healed. This is the Peter that was willing to relinquish himself of himself in order to be saturated by the light of Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is not the same Peter that had the audacity to, to pull Jesus aside, to rebuke him because he wanted a Messiah that had come to save the flesh. This is a Peter that understood in the core of his soul, in his heart, that Jesus was a Messiah that had come to save our souls, a Messiah that came to sacrifice and extend eternal life to everyone. Peter had, been, Peter had gone from being preoccupied with not being able to catch fish to a relentless and selfless desire to die daily for Christ as a fisher and healer of men. Peter was now going out into the pathos, the deeper water. Peter had grown. Peter was saturated with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Peter had been transformed from being a coward to being courageous, from being impulsive to being humble, from being ignorant to being enlightened, from being deeply inquisitive to being submissive, from being boastful to, to, of self to being boastful of Christ, and from being timid and afraid to being fearless. This is the Peter that refused Christ's menial service to wash his feet. And then realized that if he wanted to be a part of the light, that he had, he had to be washed in the light. This is the Peter that in anger and rage after all that he had learned, cut off the ear of the high priest's servant when they had come to accost Jesus in the garden. And after all of that, after, after walking with Christ, and witnessing Christ firsthand on the day of crucifixion, this is the Peter that denied Christ not once, but three times. Peter had gone from a timid disciple walking near the light to a fire-baptized and fearless apostle that was completely infiltrated by the light. My brothers and sisters, in 2018, I was a chief revenue officer. Many of you know this. I was a chief revenue officer at WGL Holdings. And I oversaw all sales and marketing and corporate communications for Washington Gas, WGL Energy Systems, WGL Energy Services, and their, and their global pipeline company. And then we sold the company in October of 2018. And all the officers retired. And after, after WGL, I, I started doing independent corporate consulting and serving on the boards of, of Wesley Theological Seminary and, and Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And, and I was focused and preparing for, for long-term ministry. But things changed. COVID came. And by the end of, of, of 2021, the income in our, in our household dropped by 92%. I remember calling my dad. I just, I just, I, I needed to talk. My, my dad had been influenced over the years by our witness. He had accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He had been baptized. He had been, he had been going to Bible study for a couple of years. My dad, the one that did not believe in God, said to me, things have a way of working themselves out. 
My dad, the one that held me in the closet, said, God will make a way somehow. My dad, the one that hit me for my faith, said, God will make a way out of no way. My dad, the one that did not believe in God, said, God will never let us down. He will always work it out. My dad that gra grabbed me by the throat back then now said, keep praying. Keep fighting. Keep being, being who you are in him. Preach the gospel. Do what you were called to do. Jesus said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For, ever, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. For the, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The doors of the church are open. My brothers and sisters, many of us are dealing with situations and going through. There's challenges that we are not transparent about, not even to our church family, not to our friends. We're too busy keeping up appearances and having preoccupation with self-preservation self-desires, self-concerns. On this day, regardless of where you're at, regardless of what you're dealing with, know that God will make a way somehow. Those are, that are watching, know that God will make a way somehow. He will make a way out of no way. He will pull you out of the muck and the mire and have you running sprints in your Air Jordan sandals, amen? And so I invite you to come to New Disciples at MetropolitanBaptist.org and to accept a church that is on the word and under the cross. A church that cares, a church that makes a difference. A church that fortifies its disciples. God gives them the strength of their concern. Strengthen them if they're bashful. God will make a way for you somehow. Whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're going through, I won't give up on you. God won't give up on you. This church won't give up on you. Won't you come? Won't you come? Won't you come? He will Give you brand new life. He's a great God. He's a good God. He's a wonderful God. Amen. God will make a way somehow. Wonderful word, honey. It's time to give. I said it's time to give. There are five ways that you can give. I guess it's going to show on the screen, but you can click donate 
on Metropolitan's homepage, metropolitanbaptist.org. You can text a giving amount to 301-888-6225. Easily cash up any amount to dollar sign Metropolitan Baptist. You can also mail your gifts to 1200 Mercantile Lane, Suite 115B, Largo, Maryland, 20774. Or you can give via RIM, our Metropolitan Baptist app. Now let us uh, recite our tithing affirmation. We are a tithing church because the word of God teaches tithing. Our experience gives witness to tithing. Our obedience to God requires tithing. Let us pray. Father God, we honor you. We praise you. We magnify you. You are good and worthy to be praised. We thank you for this experience, Father God. We thank you for the ability to give a portion of what you've given us back to you. May it be used for the lifting up and the edifying of your people and your kingdom. We give you honor, praise, and we magnify you and glorify you on this day. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Ushers, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. 
Amen. You can't beat him giving. No matter how you try. Sure as I'm living. The more you give, the more he gives to you. So keep on giving. Because it's really true that you can't be God given no matter how you try. Somebody ought to say amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The truthfulness of his word. Thank you, Dr. Lou Hutchison, for the preached word today. Thank you for your word today. We're grateful for all of our preachers as they come to proclaim the word evidence that they have prepared themselves to allow God to stand up in them. So we thank Reverend Lou for coming today and bringing the preached word. Amen. <laughs> Mr. Pardon, we say that we are a church that believes in, in prayer. We believe in the power of prayer. And um, sometimes, you know, you have to Put those words to the test. Not enough to say it. It's more about doing it. And prayer is, um, is risky. It's risky. Because God doesn't always answer when you want him to. He doesn't always answer the way you want him to. But yet we keep on believing power of prayer. Bring that to your attention because um, this coming Saturday, 9 a.m., we have what's called a church-wide prayer summit. It's called church-wide. It's not push-wide, it's church-wide. That, that just means that every church member, every church person, member or non-member, is invited to that time of prayer. If you've not registered, you can go on Realm and you can register. But we want to see you online Saturday morning at 9 a.m. as we enter into this time of prayer. There's a lot of things to pray for. When we look at the world in which we live, look at the, our young people, struggling to find themselves. We look at our government and all of its brokenness. And it gives us evidence that there is still room for prayer. And I just believe that God really does answer prayer. I believe that Prayer is so great that if we don't have a sickness, he can't heal. A brokenness, he can't mend. A problem, he can't solve. A situation, he can't fix. And that's why I just want to encourage us to come together in prayer. coming together, we prepare ourselves even now for our service of Holy Communion as we
we ask our servants to prepare our table. We may join together in this celebration of communion together. special moment in the life of the Christian church. If there's anyone today who does not have the elements, if you've been overlooked, just raise your hand and we're glad they will serve you. To those who are at home, worshiping with us online, this gives you an opportunity to gather your elements, your bread, and your wine that we may share together in this service of Holy Communion. cautioned and reminded in the words of Paul to consider this moment and what we are about to do that we don't take for granted or take lightly the significance of this moment of this meal. Jesus was very deliberate in establishing this supper that we call as the Holy Supper, that we call Holy Communion, reminding us that when opportunity knocks on the door to eat of the bread, that we do it in remembrance of him, to drink of the cup. 
cup. May we do that likewise in remembrance of him. Paul says that before we eat of these elements and partake of these elements, that we should turn to the Lord to be assured of our worthiness to partake of these elements. we think about all that we encounter in our lives, we think about the things that we say or do that we should not say or do, or the things that we fail to do, when we think about all the ways in which we misrepresent the master, we think about all of the stuff goes on in our lives and yet in the midst of all of that Christ has already forgiven us of all of our sins sins past sins present sins to come what kind of love is that that forgives in advance but how grateful we are so I want to give you the opportunity to speak with God in your own way, silently about that which is on your heart, that you may have the blessed assurance of knowing that when you partake of these elements, that you have been found worthy to eat of the bread. humble our hearts together. God, we come now before your presence to thank you for all you've done for us, individually and collectively. We can sing the words of that song, just for me. You hung your head, you died just for me. day morning you got up just for me. You sit on the right hand of the throne of God even right now just for me. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. For every prayer that has been lifted up. For every burden that's been articulated. For every struggle, every challenge. Thank you for meeting us at our point of need. Thank you for the assurance of knowing that we're not all that we ought to be. 
But thank God we're not what we used to be. And only because of your goodness and your mercy and your grace. Thank you for loving us so much that you gave your life that we may have the right to life and life everlasting. Hear our prayers. Hear our feeble cry. And meet us where we need you most. And your name, yours alone, shall be praised. For we ask it in the matchless name of Jesus. The name that's above every name. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. symbolic of the body of Jesus broken for you and for me. It represents the life of one who endured pain and adversity who encountered all that one could ever experience in life and he took it all for me and for you. So take this bread and remember some of the sacrifices of Jesus and let us eat of it together. The Bible says that in the same manner as he took the bread, took he also the cup said this is the fruit of the vine the representation of the blood of Jesus shed on Calvary's cross for the remission of sins he says I will not drink it with you again until I drink it new in the kingdom of my father with hearts of thanksgiving let us drink of the cup together
about church and ministry announcements. It's the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> That's right. Very soon, we will send your giving statements via first-class mail to the mailing address we have for you in Realm. Remember, if you have access to your Realm account, you also have access to your giving statement, so you don't have to wait. Just log in and download your statement. If you have any questions or need access to your Realm account profile, please contact our Realm Administrator at realm at metropolitanbaptist.org. Do you know persons in need of prayer while they are healing and recovering? Please submit their names to prayer at metropolitanbaptist.org and we will add them to our list. It's called the light we carry. And I think of it as a kind of a toolbox, a collection of some of the perspectives and practices I've gathered over the years to help keep me centered, even during times of high anxiety and stress. And my hope is that we can equip ourselves with new tools and attitudes so that together, maybe we'll be a little steadier with the understanding that none of us has to go through any of this alone. And I really can't wait to share even more with you. We want you to reflect and renew yourselves too. Join Reverend Adrian Blair Wise for The Light We Carry, a multi-generational virtual hybrid educational experience celebrating the light within you. This three-part class offering, beginning January 19 at 7 p.m., is based on The Light We Carry by Michelle Obama. Drawing from her life experiences, Michelle Obama shares the habits and principles she developed to successfully adapt to change and overcome various obstacles, the earned wisdom that helps her continue to become. Register on Realm today and purchase The Light We Carry, our guide by Michelle Obama through your favorite book retailer. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Join the PUSH ministry on Saturday, January 28, 2023, from 9 to 11.30 a.m. for their 12th annual Churchwide Prayer Summit, Praying for Our Next. Reverend Dr. Portia Wills Lee from Atlanta, Georgia, will be our guest speaker. Register today on Realm for this event being held via Zoom. Sunday School has a new time. Join us every Sunday at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard via Zoom. Register on Realm to make sure you have access. For questions or additional information, please contact Servant Don Williams at sundayschool at metropolitanbaptist.org. The Metro Cares Fellowship Fund was established to provide financial assistance to members of our church family and community who have been impacted by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Please continue to support the fund with your gifts and don't hesitate to let us know if we can serve you. You can contact us at Matthew 25 at metropolitanbaptist.org. Metropolitan family, please support the Christian Discipleship Council and the Matthew 25 Ministries as they kick off their annual Supper Bowl Sunday food drive. All donations will benefit our We Are One Body food pantry. Your donations can be dropped on Sundays, January 22nd, 29th, and February 5th in the chapel. The following items are needed. Oatmeal, cereal, peanut butter, jelly, syrup, canned meats, chicken, tuna, salmon, sardines, soups, Amy's lentil soup, chicken noodle, and tomato soup. You may also donate to the pantry via our five giving options. Just be sure to select or note food pantry. Your contribution will help us continue to be a blessing by extending our care to underserved communities in the DMV. Metropolitan Youth. Children in Youth Church is a fun place for kids pre-K 3 through 12th grade to learn lessons about God's love. 
Meet us on first, second, and fourth Sundays in the administrative wing of the church while parents and guardians are in 10 a.m. worship. We want each of you to attend the spiritually engaging and fun experience we call Children and Youth Church. So make sure your parents get you vaccinated and be sure to wear a mask. Parents, please register your child for these faith-based, fun Sunday mornings through Realm today. Metropolitan's Transportation Ministry is available to transport seniors and members to and from church and ministry events. Whether a loved one needs a ride or you need a pickup from the Largo Metro Station, we are here to serve. Please email the Transportation Ministry at transportation at metropolitanbaptist.org or call 202-770-8357 to let them know you need transportation. And on January 29, Reverend Michael Thomas will be preaching and we will share in Holy Communion together. 